make you aware of that because some of you do automatic payments. And if you want to suspend that for a month, um, I wanted to give you time to do that. At any rate, uh, what we're doing tonight is we're going to go over the fast of the seventh month. I think the fast of the, the 10th month, the month of Tibet got the world's attention, obviously, because of, of COVID, that the World Health Organization announced that COVID was a thing on the 10th of Tibet. And we know that it coincides with Ezekiel's slow boil, his prophecy of the slow siege of Jerusalem. And then we work through these other fast days that are mentioned in Zechariah. And we can see that projecting out either 18 or 30 months that some significant events could fall on those days if, this is, if that pattern continues that was initiated on the 10th of Tibet. And so since we've covered the other three minor fasts, which they're major this year because things are happening in big time on them this year. So we're gonna look at that last minor fast, which is the fast of the seventh month. And we tend to, um, if we're conditioned to looking at the Moedim, we hear fast of the seventh month and we'll think, oh, that's Yom Kippur. Well, the answer is yes and no. There's a specific fast, the fast of, of Gedalia. And if you don't know the story of Gedalia, you're gonna find him in Jeremiah. And it's a, it's a difficult story to read because it's, a, it's an assassination of the governor of Judah after Nebuchadnezzar has destroyed Jerusalem, taken away the captives. At first, he does leave a Judean governor in place. And the, the gist of the story is going to stretch from chapter Jeremiah 40 to probably 43. It actually extends beyond there, but all you need to know past there is they messed up. They really messed up when they went back to Egypt. And we can say the same thing of ourselves. If after everything, we decide the answer is going back to Egypt, then we're really going to mess up. And originally, I don't usually like to do a lot of reading in class because you can do the reading on your own and just do more of the commentary in class. Um, but I will probably do a, a summary, at least, of those chapters so you get an idea of the intrigues that are going on so that when we get to the application part of the lesson, like what are we supposed to learn from this fast day that was so important that it's listed in Zechariah? Um, and I, and it's, it's a real warning. I didn't realize how big a warning it was. I just thought it was the most minor of the minor fast days until I started uh, researching really the, the commentary into those chapters in Jeremiah. And I realized there is some significance to us because of its placement. And so I'm gonna pull up now the, the PowerPoint for you so you can take a gander at the calendar. And again, it's a, when we look at the Feast of the Seventh Month, we're looking at a mirror of the first month. There's a, there's a chiasm in place that you should be used to visualizing by now. And so some of the, the themes, especially, you'll see that the themes are going to be enlarged when we get over into the seventh month, for instance. In the, the first month, we'll have a fast of leaven, a fast of chametz, or yeast. And that's pretty endurable for a week. But when we get into the fall feast, we're going to have a complete fast on Yom HaKippurim. The, the fast that we're studying tonight falls on the third, usually, of Tishrei, the third of the seventh month. And then, of course, we know Yom Kippur is going to fall on the 10th of the seventh month. 
And so we want to look at some of the similarities that are there because one thing I, I try to point out to people because it I can always tell what time of year it is by the emails that arrive in my inbox. There's this flurry of, of emails before Pesach, usually even before the first of Nisan. That's usually when they'll start rolling in and it's the content of the emails that will tell me what time of year it is. It's the same thing at this time of year. As the seventh month approaches, I can tell by the content of what's in my inbox that the, the, the turn of the year, or it's literally also uh, the going out of the year, is approaching. And so things are beginning to adjust because there will be change. That's what a, a year is in Hebrew, it's Shana, it, it means a change. And so at this time of year, things are changing. In the first month, things are changing. And that's why they are great mirrors of one another, because you can sense, like I say in, in some of these emails, that change is taking place inside of people. And so helping them to sort through that, to separate fact from feeling in a lot of cases because it's a very emotional time that's another way i can tell the content of the email so many of them are so very emotional especially with new people who are beginning to celebrate the feast i don't think they're expecting the the deep emotions that they'll begin to feel just prior to pesach and the deep emotions they'll begin to stir in them just prior to Rosh Hashanah. But that's perfectly normal for that to happen because changes are, if, if you're spiritually sensitive, then I would expect changes to be taking place inside of you. I would expect you to have questions because at both seasons, you are processing your need for change in order to meet the obstacles of the coming year. And it can be very confusing when what you know in your spirit comes into conflict with your feeling because usually what's going to happen is uncertainty. Because after you've been through several cycles, you kind of recognize that it's going to happen. Like, okay, Passover's coming, get ready. I'm not really going to have to look for the chametz so much as the chametz is going to come out of the woodwork looking for me. And it's the same thing this time of year. You probably heard me say about a month ago, I just need to keep my mouth shut this month. That needs to be my resolution going into Rosh Hashanah because the less you say, the less problems you're going to have. And I, I think you'll see why. Once we get down into this um, last fast, the fast of the seventh month or the fast of Gedalia, but it also helps us to process the need for change that we're beginning to feel inside of us and probably it's already been stirring um, and we feel it with different intensities and like i say typically people who are new to the feast feel it more intensely because they're not as familiar with what goes with the cycle of the seasons and they're in that learning process and after they go through several cycles trust will build and they'll feel Maybe the same feelings, but if you know what's going on with those feelings, then it's much less intimidating. I, I've literally had a guy call me one time and say, what's wrong with me? I'm about to lose my mind. I don't know what's going on here. This is right before Passover. And I had to help him work through like, okay, the spirit is looking for chametz in your life. And it's unpleasant because he's going through your closets and pulling out your drawers and looking under your mattress you can't hide anything from the spirit, and that's why it's, it's so uncomfortable. And that's, again, because this is a mirror of the first month, this is what we're going through right now and expect it to intensify as we approach these um, fall feasts. Okay, so we're here tonight to look at the Tzom Gedalia, or the Fast of Gedalia. Uh, in Tzom, which means a fast, you can hear the root sama, which is to be thirsty. And what we see in the fast of Gedalia in a nutshell, which I'll have a bigger nut here in a minute, but 
in the tiniest nutshell, I think it involves a plan to repent. And the foundational narrative to even understand the fast of Bedaya, you would need to read all the chapters from chapter 40 to 43, and even back up a little and extend beyond if you had time. But it's considered a minor fast date. And so you will only fast food and water from sun up to sun down. Um, and it's going to follow Rosh Hashanah. I'll show you a, a calendar here on the next slide so you can kind of get placement on it. And what it's doing, it's forming a bookend with Yom HaKippurim, Yom Kippur. And because it falls on the third of Tishrei, or the third of the seventh month, it's connected uh, between, between the fast of, Gad of Gadaya and between Yom Kippur is a week. So each of those fasts will bookend a week of repentance. The, the lesser degree of the fast is going to be at the, the fast of Gedalia. Of course, the greater degree of the fast is going to be on Yom HaKippurim. And so if you had read those chapters or if you are familiar with those chapters in Jeremiah, you understand that we're grieving because Gedalia was murdered. And so it's, it's thought that he was murdered on Rosh Hashanah, on the first of Tishrei, when they were feasting, when they were having the joyous meal on the first of the month, then um, the, the assassin comes in with 10 other men and he puts the governor Gedalia to the sword. And so you wouldn't observe um, a fast on a high holy day where you're required to rejoice. And so therefore it is pushed off. And remember the first two days of Tishrei are really one day. You observe the Feast of Trumpets for two days. And so it's pushed off until the third day. Some accounts say he wasn't killed until the third. Who knows? We weren't there. Uh, but the assumption is that it was during his uh, feast on the Feast of Trumpets where he was assassinated. So if it were observed on the day he was actually murdered, you would still have bookends, except you would have 10 days from Yom Teruah to Yom HaKippurim. But that's, that's the way to visualize this particular fast. It's like a repentance bookend, with Yom Kippur always being the book on the other end. So here's the calendar. And you can see on the, the 19th, we'll have the first day of the Feast of Trumpets. And then on the 20th, we'll have the second day of the Feast of Trumpets. And then the very next day is going to be the Feast of Gedalia. Um, it might be adjusted at times were it to fall on a Shabbat. Again, you don't, if, you're, if your commandment is to rejoice, then um, you don't want to have a, a mourning day and a fasting day when the commandment is actually to do just the opposite. So at times it's, it's going to be pushed off that way. But normally it'll fall on the third of Tishrei or the third of the seventh month. And let's see, if you drop down, you can see that Yom Kippur is going to fall on the, the Monday following the fast of Gedalia. So there you can see the bookend um, aspect of it, that it's going to separate those days. So basically you have a, a week. Okay, um, that gives you the GPS. All right, so there, just like everything else we study, there's sometimes dis 
disputes, just like there's a dispute over whether Gedalia was murdered on the first or the third. Uh, but some sources may list Yom HaKippurim as the fast of the seventh month. That's kind of intuitive because we're more familiar with that fast. But it uh, is a given that Yom Kippur is the sixth moed of the seventh. So even though it is a fast, the four minor fasts are based on history. Now, some of the Moedim are also based on history. But the, the minor fasts, they're almost, we would say almost strictly relative to Israel or Judah's history. And so when we compare the role of history, to the weight of the Moedim, which we're told in Psalm 75 too, the Moedim are the appointed times. These are the things that stand, that endure. And so even at that, when we're looking at the minor fasts, we're told, and this is pretty much our benchmark uh, verse, when we're looking at the, the four fasts, it's in Zechariah 8.19, thus says the Lord of hosts, the fast of the fourth month, the fast of the fifth month, the fast of the seventh month, and the fast of the tenth month shall become occasions for joy and gladness, happy festivals for the house of Judah, but you must love honesty and integrity. So the implication there is until the house of Judah loves honesty and integrity, these four fasts are going to hold a sad element. But if we pay attention to the, to the Rx, to the prescription there, then honesty can lead to joy and integrity can lead to gladness. So here's the bigger nut in the nutshell. We know that the third of Tishrei is a fast day mourning the assassination of the Jewish governor Gedalia ben Achikam. And uh, he was appointed by King Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylonia. Um, even after the destruction of Jerusalem, Nebuchadnezzar didn't want to completely destroy Judah because it would not be profitable if he completely destroyed it. Instead, he wants to subdue it and then leave people in the land that he can tax and who can supply him with certain things that an empire needs. And so he appoints Gedaliah to be the governor. Uh, I've got the land of Israel there, but uh, more specifically the land of Judah. Because remember, Assyria has already taken many of the, the northern tribe captive at this point. Even though in this story, we see that there are Israelites uh, coming from the northern tribes who make a journey down to Jerusalem and they're unaware of the destruction of Jerusalem. So that tells you that there were still remnants of the northern tribes in the land and they were still coming up to Jerusalem. But we also can see by the description of them that they have descended um, in terms of their observance. They're making some mistakes. And, uh, and it, it tells you how low that the Israelites and the, the Jews had fallen by that point in their history at the destruction of the temple. And so the first temple we know was destroyed in 586 BC and um, there was jealousy. The, the king of Ammon, remember uh, Ammon and Moab or Moab, they're descended from Lot and they're on the the eastern side of the Jordan. He's jealous of Gedaliah's position. He's fearful of Gedaliah's position because he's resisting King Nebuchadnezzar. And he sees Gedaliah as being a, a sympathizer and a puppet of Nebuchadnezzar. And so he dispatches somebody that Gedaliah trusts, a person named Ishmael. And so this Ishmael joins the, the Rosh Hashanah party, and he and his 10 men pull swords and just slaughter. Uh, there's a great slaughter. And then not only do they kill the governor 
and everybody at the party, they go to a garrison of the Babylonians and also kill the soldiers at the Babylonian garrison. And so you can see how this was going to cause a problem. Um, at any rate, when Gedaliah was killed, as we read through the stories, the story in the chapters, we realize that it's spelling the end of that small remnant of a Jewish community that was allowed to remain in the Holy Land after the destruction. And there's this incident with Jeremiah. They actually kidnap Jeremiah and Baruch and take them to Egypt. And um, at any rate, there was Jeremiah prophesied, if you do this, if you go down to Egypt, you're going to be killed anyway because something bad's going to happen to Pharaoh. Nebuchadnezzar is going to take advantage of it. History bears out that that's exactly what happened. And so Nebuchadnezzar was the, able to push as far uh, south and west into Egypt, destroyed parts of Egypt. And as far as history knows, the Jews who kidnapped Jeremiah and who hid out there from Nebuchadnezzar, they were killed along with the Egyptians. And so what this event, if you can kind of now begin to see the parallel, we know that the Israelites were mostly lost to the Assyrian provinces. And this is the bookend of the story with Judah, because now the Jews, the remnant of the Jews who weren't taken into captivity in Babylon, they're going to be lost in Egypt. And so um, let's just go on. And here, I just gave you a few quotes about it um, before we get into the meat of it. It says in uh, the Jewish holidays that Gedaliah, who was a supporter of Jeremiah and widely respected in the Jewish community, was a neutralist. He cooperated with Babylonia rather than joining the pro-Egyptian faction. And this is not just a objective observation of Gedalia. It makes sense that Gedalia would be a neutralist if he listened to Jeremiah's prophecies. Because we realize at that point, there's, there's no turning back the, that Judah has descended to such a state of idolatry and the land has to have its rest. So they're going to go to Babylon for 70 years, period, the end. And so Jeremiah's advice is cooperate and get this over with as painlessly as possible. Um, so Gedaliah, who was a decent man from all reports, um, was assassinated by the zealots. And it says that this is significant and we do need to make some effort to commemorate even today. Um, and what we're going to try to unpack is why is it significant today? Because it just seems like a little history lesson. Um, and then Greenstein says to observe a minor fast following Rosh Hashanah can contribute significantly to the process of teshuva. First, the intensity of Rosh Hashanah, that dramatic opening of the 10 days of Teshuvah, does not simply dissipate on the day after. And that's the temptation. You just, you have this glorious Rosh Hashanah, and then it's really just hard to get into the proper, you know, mournful, repentant state of mind that you're going to have to have on Yom Kippur. Because you're already looking beyond Yom Kippur to the joy of Sukkot. And so he, he says, this is a help. It sustains our attention on the spiritual process at hand. And then second, the minor fast anticipates the great fast of Yom Kippur. It's like a warm up. It's the most awesome day only a week ahead by which time we should have achieved a readiness to change. And without you know, going back through pages and pages and pages and books and books and books about the process of repentance between Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur, 
we can say that what goes on on Rosh Hashanah, if you've noticed the liturgy of Rosh Hashanah, even though it's known as a day of repentance, there's very little about repentance relative to just glorifying the king on Rosh Hashanah. The Feast of Trumpets is about the, the coronation of the king. It's all about directing our attention heavenward and receiving and acknowledging his kingdom. So even though it's known as a day of repentance, the heavy lifting of repentance is supposed to be initiated on this day and then culminated on Yom Kippur. And so there is a judgment that is passed on Yom Kippur. And it has to do with your intention. Excuse me, on Rosh Hashanah. There is a judgment on Rosh Hashanah, the Feast of Trumpets. You're judged in terms of your intention. But when the day of Yom Kippur comes, the understanding is you have to have gone beyond simply confessing the sin and wanting or wishing, remorseful, that you had not sinned. There's elements of teshuva that I went over in a, back in the spring in that um, live stream. I think it was called the drill to your soul that had the components of repentance in it. So I'm not going to go over that again. But the idea is that you're going to be judged according to your intention on Rosh Hashanah, but this is not sealed up until the closing of the gates at Yom Kippur. And something should have changed significantly between trumpets and Yom HaKippurim. Because by Yom HaKippurim, the only way we know that it was anything more than intention is if you have a plan to change, which is what he's talking about. We, by that time, we've achieved a readiness to change. Sometimes, we say, I really don't want to do that anymore. But what we really mean is, I wish I didn't want to do that anymore because I still want to do it. <laughs> and that's, that's a hard one. <laughs> when we say we want to quit, and the truth is we don't really want to quit, but we wish we wanted to quit. So between you know, the first of the month and the 10th of the month, it has to be go, go beyond wanting to want to change, if you truly want to change, then you should have generated a plan for change. You should have figured out how you're going to take aggressive steps to make that change in the area that you have said that you, you made the mistake and you're sorry for the mistake and you don't want to do it again. Where the uncertainty comes in, well, what if I do? And the chances are you probably will because some things are a little harder to knock out. You need a plan. Don't go into it without a plan. This is what I'm going to do. You know, whether you're going to have a cuss jar or you have to pay money every time you use a cuss word, um, whether you're going to have somebody hold you accountable if they see you do this thing that you don't want to do anymore. Um, whether you're going to make a personal calendar and you're going to meet certain deadlines. I don't know what it might be, but you need a practical plan to put into place that shows that you, you were sincere, that you didn't just confess your sin, that you don't just feel guilty about your sin, but you're actually making specific plans to change the sin. Here's what Arthur Green said about it. He says, while well, Shabbat, Haggadol, the Shabbat Haggadol sermon was lengthy. And remember, we did um, the most important Shabbat of your life. We did that back in the spring. Well, that's Shabbat Haggadol before Pesach. Now we're coming up on Shabbat Shuva, which is its bookend in the fall, or its mirror in the fall. And he says, well, the Shabbat Haggadol sermon was lengthy because of the details of Passover law to be explained. The sermon on Shabbat Shuvah 
pretty much was like a old time Pentecostal service. He says it was to serve as a hit or a root lit chuva, an impassioned call for repentance. It was offered amid tears and wailing and was so delivered as to wring dread and compassion from the most stone-like heart. And then at this season, you might hear um, the expression Shabbat Shuva. And we're told that the Shabbat between Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur is known as Shabbat Shuva, the Sabbath of turning after the Haftorah, which begins with Shuva Israel, return, O Israel, to the Lord your God, in Hosea 14.2. And you might hear it called Shabbat Shuva as well. Right, so we've got lots of things just popping up into place right now. Uh, it's been a long, hot summer, but now you can, you can feel the change probably in the air, depending on, you know, I don't know what your season is where you are, but definitely right now. We feel the changing of the seasons, not just in the natural world, but in the spiritual world. And so the portion that we read last week, Nitzavim, which is read prior to Rosh Hashanah, is actually the template of tshuva. And this is what Ramban, if, if you're not sure who Ramban and Rambam are, if you're reading sometimes, you'll run across those. Um, and Ramban, just look at the, the last letter. If you see Ramban, Ban, ending in noon, then you know it's Nachmanides. And then if you see Rambam, the last letter is M, and so you know it's Maimonides. That's how I tell them apart. Um, but there's two different ideas about repentance. And remember, the fast Gedalia is like our little Yom Kippur. It's our warm-up for Yom Kippur. And so the Ramban, Nachmanides, says that what we read this last week in Deuteronomy 30, 1 through 10, it is the template for tshuva. And I'm going to read to you from that and show you where he's getting that. Ramban identifies it from the temple services that we read about in Leviticus. Of course, at that point, it was a mishkan, but it migrated into the temple. And I want to read to you from Rabbi Jonathan Sachs, who discusses the difference between the two opinions and what makes them both valid applications, because we're interested. We don't have a temple service. We're out here in the exile. And so this, this is of interest of, to us because without a sacrificial system, we still need a system of repentance. And we have a template. And what's interesting is that both of those applications, whether you're reading Ramban or Rambam, as they're reading the texts, what they see is that both applications require a return to the land of Israel. Because this is what the fast of Gedalia mourns. When the Jews assassinated, not the Jews as a people, but the, the zealot Jews, when they assassinated Gedalia, that set off a chain of events that ended up in forfeiture of living in the land of Israel. Instead, they ran to find a place that was more secure, that was safer. And so in the fast of Gedaliah, we're mourning and saying, hey, once we lose our identity with the land and instead we favor safety, security somewhere else. And one thing that uh, one commentary pointed out in these verses in Jeremiah is that one reason that they were so eager to go to Egypt rather than do what Jeremiah told them to do was that they had descended to such a level of idolatry 
and they have now seen the consequences of idolatry. He will spit you out of the land. And they say, why not go to Egypt where we can at least hide among the idols of Egypt? We can carry on with our idolatry and nobody's going to point it out. There's not going to be punishments. There's not going to be captivity. We can just carry on with our idolatry and we won't stand out. We don't want to live up to the obligation of living in the land and righteousness. And so he allowed them. He allowed them to go. Uh, which, if you're worried about Jeremiah, they did eventually turn him loose. Uh, <laughs> he, he, he was kidnapped, but he was not killed at that point, as far as we know. So let's see, where's that book? Right here. I'll take this off for a second. And this just had so many good thoughts in it. I didn't even try to put it into PowerPoints. Um, if you want to take notes, but I'm looking at uh, pretty much the two ideas concerning Shuva. It says, according to Maimonides, Shuva has its origin in the temple and its sacrifices, specifically those brought for transgressions. And this is, remember how we study the sin offering, the guilt offering, and so forth. And by prescribing those things very specifically, uh, we knew exactly what to do if we sinned. Or if we felt guilty, we knew exactly what to do. He says, part of the right for these offerings was a verbal confession called a vidui. And if you have an Orthodox Siddur, you've probably seen that at the conclusion of the, the Amidah prayer, the Shemoni Asrei. If you keep reading, you'll slide right on into the Bidui, which means confession. And it's, the, it's based on the prayer that Daniel prayed. Uh, if you ever want to compare the two. Uh, but that was part of it. You didn't just bring this particular animal for your sin or your guilt, you also had to confess the sin. It says the conditions for the sincerity of such confessions were A, an acknowledgement that one did wrong, B, remorse or shame, and C, a determination not to repeat the offense in the future. It says these three are the fundamental elements of Shuva. So you need those three elements. And that's why by Yom Kippur, we say, okay, yes, you confessed your sin, but, but do you have a plan not to repeat it? It's, it's not just to bring a sacrifice and start all over again tomorrow. <laughs> you know, same sin, same time tomorrow. No, it wasn't supposed to be like that. You had to have a plan of change. And so he says, there's obvious questions here. If Shuva is linked to the sacrificial order, what happened to it once the temple was destroyed and the system came to an end? Well, we've got very specific answers to that in the letter to the Hebrews. Uh, but there's lots of parallels. So remember how it says, you know, if we will confess our sins, that he is faithful and just to forgive our sins. This is also the language of the New Testament. So he says, uh, confession is in fact a separate command in its own right and applies with or without a sacrifice in and outside the land of Israel. Verbal confession, vidui, is the outer act. Shuba is its internal correlate. So if you confess the sin, that's the outward thing that you need to do. But the inner thing needs to be this plan of change, this, this teshuva. Now, Nachmanides, in the other opinion, he says it's in a completely different source, Nitzavim. And 
I'll just read that to you. It's Deuteronomy 31. It says, when all these blessings and curses I have set before you come upon you, and uh, if you got your Bible in front of you and you mark in your Bible, this would be the phrase to underline. He says, you take them to heart. Wherever the Lord your God disperses you among the nations, and when you and your children, and then you would underline, return to the Lord your God and obey him with all your heart and with all your soul, according to everything I command you today, then the Lord your God will, and then you would underline, restore your fortunes and have compassion on you and gather you again, you would underline again, from all the nations where he scattered you. Even if you have been banished to the most distant land under the heavens, from there the Lord your God will gather you and bring you back. He will bring you to the land that belonged to your fathers, and you will take possession of it. He will make you more prosperous and numerous than your fathers. You will again, you would underline again, obey the Lord and follow all his commands that I am giving you today. Then the Lord your God will make you prosperous in all the work of your hands and in the fruit of your womb, the young of your livestock and the crops of your land. The Lord will again, underline again, delight in you and make you prosperous, just as he delighted in your fathers, if you obey the Lord your God and keep his commands and decrees that are written in this book of the law and turn, underline turn, to the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul. And then the next verse continues, for this command, which I am commanding you today, is not too difficult for you or beyond your reach. Which command? It's the command of Shuva. And I know a lot of us have used that passage to, to prove to our disbelieving friends that, uh, you know, it's not too far away. It's not up in the heavens. It's not across the sea. It's near us, even in our mouth. We can do the tour. But if we look at the fuller context, and again, those underlying passages, what we see is that each one of them deals specifically with shuva. And if you're not sure what this word is I'm saying, <laughs> it's, uh, no, not yeshiva spell check. But it's uh, it'll be spelled out sometimes teshuva. But if you hear somebody say teshuva, you know they can't speak Hebrew. <laughs> because if you hear an Israeli say it, somebody who actually speaks Hebrew, it'll sound like they're saying tshuva, tshuva because of the, the way that the syllables are run together there. And so specifically, he says, the most striking feature of that passage is that it's a set of variations on the Hebrew verb lashuv, the root of the noun shuva. All those phrases that I told you to underline, take to heart, restore your fortunes, again, turn, and the Hebrew texts are forms of that verb, lashuv. And he goes on and he says, all right, what is a sin? And, and before I do that, before I forget, remember I said that whether you're reading Maimonides' commentary on this being related, repentance being related to the sacrificial system, or whether you're reading Nachmanides, who says this is located in Nitzavim and it applies anywhere, anytime, any place you happen to be. Both of those contexts require a return to the land, at least up here in your intention, because the sacrificial system only exists in the land or could only exist in the land. If you're looking at Nitzavim, the whole context of it is telling you is if you will do this, if you will do tshuva wherever you are, then I will bring you back to the land. So 
It's almost as though there is no repentance without the land of Israel being involved in the equation somewhere. Whether you're literally there or whether you're not literally there, it's part of the whole mindset of repentance. And you don't ever hear that. But it's really plain. I mean, that's just, once he pointed it out, I'm like, that is so common sense. You can't have repentance without either being in the land or thinking about the land. And him, based on your repentance, bringing you back to it, which makes sense because of everything we know about the Garden of Eden and being restored to that garden eventually that's, that's hovering right above it. But he says, sin is an act in the wrong place. It disturbs the moral order of the world. The words for sin, chet, and avera, both have this significance. Chet comes from the same verb as to miss a target, to miss the mark. Avera, like the English word transgression, means to cross a boundary. But do you hear the same word we studied last week as it pertains to the covenant where you're about to pass into the covenant? Well, see, if you pass into the covenant and then you start committing immoral behavior, then you're doing these things in the wrong place. And he says the land's going to have to spit you out because you improperly behaved once you crossed in. And so now you have transgressed. You've crossed into a place where this act doesn't belong. So it means to cross a boundary, to enter forbidden territory, to be in a place one should not be. A sinner has no place in the garden which is just like, hallelujah, Yeshua, right? Because <laughs> we don't have much hope without him. This is because a sin is an act in the wrong place. Its consequence is that the one who performs it finds himself in the wrong place, in exile, meaning not at home. Sin alienates. It distances us from God, and the result is that we are distanced from where we ought to be, where we belong. And so, tshuva, he says, is the superglue. Uh, it means a physical return to the land and the spiritual return to God. It's a double, tshuva, he says, is a double homecoming. It's coming back to the presence of God, and it's being mindful of the physical return to the land. And he says, in this sense, repentance, shuva, is less atonement than homecoming. Atonement is, is the aspect of Yom Kippur that, that we always get. We, yeah, we get that. We're sinners. It has to be atoned for. But he's saying we're leaving something out of the equation here based on both of these templates. It's homecoming. And because it's homecoming, what does it bring to mind? Being restored to the garden. And he says fasting that we would do on the, the fast of Gedaliah or Yom Kippur, he says it's nothing. It's a mere ritual without the ethical conduct that goes with it. Just like it says in Isaiah 58, 6, uh, is this not the fast that I have chosen? To loose the chains of injustice, untie the cords of the yoke, set the oppressed free, break every yoke, share your food with the hungry, and to provide the poor wanderer with shelter. And so, especially the poor wanderer, it reminds us of Israel out there wandering. That even ministering to this poor wanderer is a reminder to yourself of who you are apart from the land, the covenant, and the people. And that at some point in this process of repentance that we go through for our sins, that we're not to forget where home is. That repentance is the process of bringing us back home. So he says, both the Ramban and the Ramban are correct. <laughs> Which is very, <laughs> you know, 
much uh, right up my alley. Yes, we can learn from both opinions. But the beautiful thing about both opinions is what ties them together is the return to the garden, the return to the land of Israel. And so that's exciting. All right, we'll go back to the share screen. which, hang on a sec. I just hate to do this to you if you haven't read all those chapters. Um, I'm very cautious about sharing things on Chabad because I have some real issues with their opinion of Messiah. But for the sake of this article, I'm just going to, this is a great overview of the history of those four chapters. Um, I've given you some of it. Let's see. Add to what I've already said, uh, where Nebuchadnezzar appointed Gedaliah. It says the prophet Jeremiah had been allowed to choose between remaining in Judah and going to Babylon as an honored guest of the Babylonian royal house. He chose to remain in uh, Mitzpah, and then later we find him in Bethlehem. Um, but Mitzpah was um, north of Jerusalem, and this is where Gedaliah estab established his governorship. And so um, Mitzpah, became the spiritual center of the people because remember Nebuchadnezzar is not going to allow them at that point to rebuild Jerusalem. That's not going to happen until much, many years later until those years are fulfilled. It says Gedaliah was a wise man, gentle and modest. He zealously began to encourage people to cultivate the fields and the vineyards and thus lay the foundation of security. And if you'll read those chapters in Jeremiah, you'll see that pretty much the second the idolaters are evacuated out of the land and sent to Babylon, the land begins to produce again. The, the famine goes away. The, um, there is so much produce that in the story, you'll see how these men talk Ishmael into not killing them because they'll say they have so much of this produce that it's hidden. They've had such a great crop now that the idolaters are gone. Um, but he does. He just tells people, the people who are left, go on about your business, plant your vineyards, uh, harvest your fields, and so forth. And they actually began to prosper. And uh, lots of Jews came back once they heard that, the, that Judea had become stable again. And... Um, as long, he, he would tell them, you know, as long as you're loyal to the king of Babylonia, we're going to have peace and security until this, this exile of 70 years is fulfilled. And even the, the soldiers in the Babylonian garrison didn't, you know, bother them. Of course, they taxed them, but in terms of harming them, they didn't. Uh, and so it, it was on the, on the road to recovery because of how things blossomed once the idolaters left, uh, or at least the great number of them. But it says, among the refugees who had joined Gedaliah was Ishmael, the son of Netanya, a descendant of the royal house of Zedekia, the last king of Judah. Ishmael was an ambitious man who would stop at nothing to attain his goal. The honor and success that Gedaliah had won filled him with jealousy, he began to plot against him, and then he allied himself with the king of Ammon, uh, who did not want that Jewish colony growing next to him. So a man, an advisor to Gedaliah named Yochanan, learned of the assassination plot. And not only did Yochanan warn the governor not only did Yochanan warn Gedaliah that there was a, an assassination plot afoot, um, 
It also says, let's see. Make sure I get this right. Yeah, here it is. In chapter 40, verse 13. Yochanan, son of Kareach, and all the officers of the army that had been in the field came to Gedaliah at Mitzpah. They said to him, do you know that Baali, king of the children of Ammon, has sent Ishmael, son of Netanya, to assassinate you? But Gedaliah, son of Achikam, did not believe them. And Yochanan, son of Kareach, spoke to Gedaliah secretly. In other words, they openly confront him. And this is not small potatoes here. It says all the officers of the army that had been in the field. These are trustworthy, loyal men. And so thinking that maybe I can talk to him privately and he'll listen to me, Yochanan takes him aside secretly and says, let me go and kill Ishmael. And no one will know. Why should he kill you? And then all of Judah who have gathered to you will be scattered and the remnant of Judah lost. But Gedaliah, son of Achikam, said to Yochanan, son of Kareh, do not do this thing, for you were speaking falsely about Ishmael. So it comes down to, he's been warned by reliable, many reliable witnesses that there's a, an assassination plot on his life. And instead of heeding the warnings, he postures into this, uh, oh, that's just Lashon Hara. It couldn't possibly be true. And so um, Ishmael then sees the opportunity. He is invited by Gedaliah to come to the feast on Rosh Hashanah. He brings 10 men with him. And it's kind of interesting that... Uh, Again, we have those bookends between Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur, and then he shows up with 10 men. Um, but then what they do is they rise up during the feast and they put the governor and his people to the sword. There's a big massacre. Um, and so Yochanan and a few men escaped the massacre uh, because they weren't in Mitzpah at that time. And so when Yochanan hears of it, he rallies an army, pursues Ishmael. And it says, overtaking Ishmael near Gibbon and Benjamin, Yochanan succeeded in freeing the captives. And by the way, the king's daughters, even though the king was taken captive to Babylon, they left his daughters in the land. And Ishmael took the king's daughters captive, but then... Yochanan recovers them. And if you've, um, if you've been with me in the study on Song of Songs, that should sound familiar because the Torah is um, thought of as the king's daughter uh, in a parable sense. At any rate, I just thought that was interesting. So now um, Ishmael runs off. They have the captives back. And so what they do, the, the Jews now who are left, they say, oh no, we're in trouble now because Ishmael and his men have killed the soldiers at the garrison. They've killed the governor that Nebuchadnezzar appointed. Nebuchadnezzar is gonna send more soldiers and they're just gonna kill us all. So they go to Bethlehem, Bethlehem, and they wanna ask Jeremiah for advice. And they say, you know, um, tell us what to do and we'll do it. And they don't mean it when they say that, because when he tells them what to do, they do exactly the opposite. And it says for 10 days, Jeremiah prayed to God, which if we're talking about the time between Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur, this prophecy would have come right at Yom Kippur the Yom Kippur Sukkot period. It says for 10 days, Jeremiah prayed to God and finally he received a message. And so, and, and you can read this in Jeremiah, it says, thus says the God of Israel, if you will still dwell in this land, I will build you and not destroy you. 
I will plant you and not pluck you up. Fear not the king of Babylonia, of whom you are afraid, for I am with you to save you. But if you say, we will not dwell in this land, disobeying the voice of your God, saying, no, but we will go into the land of Egypt, then it shall come to pass that the sword which you feared shall overtake you there in the land of Egypt, and the famine whereof you were afraid shall follow close after you in Egypt, and there you shall die. God has spoken to you, O remnant of Judah, go not into Egypt, know with certainty, for I have warned you this day. And so in spite of the fact that they say, we'll do exactly what you tell us, Jeremiah, instead they become angry. They act like it's a big conspiracy, like it's a big plot that Baruch, Jeremiah's disciple, is behind it. And so they kidnap Jeremiah and Baruch and take them down to Egypt. Um, Jeremiah warns them again, and the prophet's warnings did come true. Now, from what we know, um, it came true in the time of Pharaoh Hophra when he was assassinated, and then Nebuchadnezzar moved in, invaded, destroyed the land. The Jews who had fled to Egypt died, and that's where it came true. Now, it does make the note, we don't know where Jeremiah died, but it's believed that he and Baruch did go to Babylon uh, once they were released uh, by the zealots. And they did travel back because it had the invitation to go to Babylon and, ha and have a, a position of honor and security there, that they did go back to encourage their, their brothers in Babylon during the exile. So it sounds like a long story, but that's really the short story when you look at those chapters. So now we're going to back here and try to finish up. So the moral of the story <laughs> is that it's better to endure hardship in the land of covenant and do tshuva than to run away to Egypt so that our sins will be maybe on a scale of one to 10, a little lower than the Egyptians. In other words, hiding our sins among the great sins. And I think we all have that sense that if we were to live in the land of Egypt, some of the things we get away with here, wherever here is for us, we would have the sense that, no, you couldn't do that in the land. And that's why we're looking forward to going to the land because like Lot, who's seeing things around him that are vexing him day by day, we are ready for that obligation as opposed, you know, to doing fewer sins among the great sins of whatever nation we live in. Another thing we can see, they went to Jeremiah and asked for counsel that they had no intention of keeping if it didn't match what they'd already made up their minds to do. So don't ask for counsel if your mind is already made up. Don't look for some self-affirming prophecy that's going to exempt you from holding to this more difficult path. The, the obligations of the land are high. In other words, don't kidnap the prophecy and drag it along with you and try to force it into what you've already decided to do. Um, and I think I've already mentioned how the, once the, the major number of idolaters were exiled to Assyria and Babylonia, then the land starts to produce again. And of course, we can see that that stopped once the remnant of the Jews left. It was pretty much a desolation until uh, 47 or 48. Okay, now we'll finish up right here. Because there's an important principle, and, and let me preface this by saying I'm not encouraging you to go out and kill anybody, literally kill anybody, okay? <laughs> Let's just get that. <laughs> you never know when YouTube scans these things what they're going to pick up on. This is not an encouragement to go kill somebody. But there is a principle in Scripture, and you'll find it in Jeremiah 40, 13 through 16. And it's, it's based in the Torah. I'll give you the verses out of the Torah. But 
It's called The Principle of the Dean Rodef. And a Rodef is a pursuer. And in the, the Dean Rodef, you would assassinate or maim a person who has spoken an intention to kill prior to the act or is in active pursuit of another person to kill him or her. Now that is so interesting because it has been in the news, at least here in the United States, uh, because we have been, some of our cities have been overrun with these rioters and looters that of course, we have people who are taking a stand and say, no, you will not. <laughs> and there is this principle. Remember, Yochanan says, look, all your officers here are telling you this man intends to come kill you. Let me go kill him first. And he says, oh, no, that's just Lashon Hara. But the, the Dean Rodef literally means law of the pursuer. And the origin, at least of the halakha, concerning the Dean Rodef, and it's abused. It's been abused in history um, by people who, again, were zealots, and they misapplied it. But it's found in uh, the tractate Sanhedrin 73a. I wanted to say Nezi King for some reason. But um, there is a restriction to this law. You may not kill the Rodef who is pursuing you to kill you or who has stated an intent to come kill you. If there's something you can do, some lesser means that would stop the murder. In other words, uh, <laughs> you know, if somebody's breaking into your house, logic would tell you fire center mass. But the, the law of the Dean Rodef would say, but you have to try something, if it's not putting you in jeopardy, if there's something lesser you can do, if you can shoot his knees rather than kill him. Now, how many people are good enough with that much adrenaline going in a high stress situation to shoot somebody in the knees rather than shoot center mass? not recommended unless you're a marksman. But if you were a marksman and you were reasonably sure you could do it, then you would be obligated to shoot his knees rather than shoot center mass. And so that's the idea. If there's something, some obstacle you can put in the way so that you would not have to, to kill the, you know, assassin who's intended to kill an innocent person. There's, that's what you have to pursue before you, because this is basically vigilante justice. It's not something that comes before a court of law. And in fact, if you've followed the history of the Mossad, this is the principle that they operate on in modern times. It's the principle of the Dean Rodef. If somebody is coming to kill me, then I may kill them first. But they also are known for all sorts of sabotage intended to discourage the pursuer from actually following through. And so in our time, hopefully we're, we're not running from somebody who's literally trying to kill us. But Leviticus 19.16, it falls under this heading, again, of the Dean Rodef. It says, you shall not go about as a slanderer among your people, and you are not to act against the life, and that Hebrew word there is dumb, or blood, of your neighbor. I am the Lord. And then if we back up a little bit into Leviticus 17.11, we can see it's still under the heading of, the life, the nefesh of the flesh is in the blood. It's in the dumb. And so we know your nefesh, your soul, your life, it's your appetite, emotion, desire, and intellect. And that's all housed in the basar or the flesh. 
And so when you murder a person's soul, you're letting their blood. And you can see now how he has juxtaposed it with slander. In other words, there's more than just physical murder. There's gossip. They're slandering another person. And so in Jewish tradition, it teaches that a human being is the blood of God. They're determining that by taking the first letter of Elohim, which is Aleph, adding Dam, which is where we get Adam or man. And so they say to murder a human being is to let the blood of God. Because he is a spirit, but we are his creations. We are the, we are in his image and a human being made in the image of God has a physical blood and a physical body. But God who does not have a physical body or physical blood, we are that representation of him. And so if you observe that someone is about to let the blood of an innocent person who is made in the image of Elohim, then you are obligated to stop it or to obstruct it by less lethal means. And so now we can make that, that leap there between physically stopping a murder and stopping gossip. Stopping the shanhara, stopping the slander. And that, that should ring true because now in the internet age, we have so many opportunities throughout the day to stop slander, gossip, the shanhara, just stop it in its tracks, to obstruct it from letting any more blood of a human being who's made in the image of Elohim. Because at the point that you let the blood of their emotion, see, emotion is part of their life, their nefesh. When you're letting that blood, the life is in the blood. Uh, words can kill. And if we observe it in progress, we need to stop the, the crime in progress. Here's another one that falls under the heading of the Dean Rodef, Deuteronomy 22:25. It says, but if in the open country a man meets a young woman who is betrothed and the man seizes her and lies with her, then only the man who lay with her shall die. But you shall do nothing to the young woman. She has committed no offense punishable by death. For this case, is like that of a man attacking and murdering his neighbor because he met her in the open country and though the betrothed young woman cried for help there was no one to rescue her the assumption there is had she cried out and someone were there someone who lived in the covenant an israelite heard her cry out because she was being attacked that she would have been rescued. And so if a person sees a person pursuing another person to rape her or even him, it's even like if you saw a man chasing a little boy, he or she is obligated to stop it. Even to the extent of death, if the pursuer cannot be stopped, any other way because the text tells you that the rape case is like a murder case it's on the same level it's judged at the same level and if you see a rape in progress it's just like as if you were to see a murder in progress you are obligated to stop it if you have to kill the person you kill the person if you can just maim the person and stop them that way, then you maim the person and stop them that way. And so our application. This is a time of tshuva. And this was the time, at least in the book of Jeremiah, 
as the first of Tishrei rolls around, the third of Tishrei, the fast of Gedali rolls around, it's a great time annually to think about the principle of the Dean Rodef, one who's pursuing another in order to assassinate him or her, particularly with the tongue. If you hear it, you must stop it. Because if left unchecked, like it says in Leviticus, Lashan Hara brings death. On the other hand, we can be so self-righteous that we ignore a faithful and true witness and put it in the category of Lashan Hara when it's not Lashan Hara at all. Gedalia had a serious warning. It says from all the officers of the army, that's just not one or two people of insignificance. This is a, a great number of reliable witnesses. And they say, Gedalia, Ishmael is going to, to assassinate you. And he says, oh no, that's, that's just, that he would never do that. Listen, if you've got valid witnesses or the person himself telling you he's going to kill you, <laughs> you may not believe it, but you better take precautions. Had Gedalia taken precautions, maybe he wouldn't have needed this person at his Rosh Hashanah party. Maybe he would have only admitted Ishmael and not the 10 others. Maybe he would have made sure his own protectors had their swords strapped on and didn't drink too much. <laughs> you have to take precautions. If somebody tells you they're going to kill you, believe them or at least believe they're capable of it. And there's, there's no better witness than the person who states the intent that I intend to do it. So again, how can you stop them? Well, again, if, you, if you're obligated to maim the person, if it's possible in order to stop them, in other words, Rambam said, you know, cut off a hand if he's going to use his sword, blind him, whatever you have to do to stop him from committing this murder. In other words, try to make the sin impossible to complete. If we're transferring this to gossip and slander, that kind of murder, you might need to secure some of your doors. You need to control your space. You need to control who's in your space. And this is a time of year to evaluate who is in your personal space. This is the time of year to evaluate your communication, your fellowship with other people. Have you let somebody in too close who doesn't need to be that close to you, who doesn't need that much personal information about you? And one way you can clamp down on that is limit how much information you put about yourself on social media. And don't be so self-righteous about Lashan Hara that you are rejecting faithful witnesses, people who have never been known to be liars. If they come to you and say, hey, look, so-and-so is subverting you. They're planning something against you. They're performing phone ministry against you. Well, it, it's time to start securing the space. Avoid the person. You might want to confront the person first. Of course, if, if they're doing it, they're not likely to tell you the truth. But if you need to confront, confront. But you definitely want to avoid a person who has stated an intent to hurt you. Don't be naive like Gedalia, because we're still talking about how naive he was today. And that's the principle of Rosh Hashanah. You need to have an intention to repent. You do need to look for the chametz. And then by the time we arrive at Yom Kippur, don't just have intention, don't just have the confessional. Don't just say the words. Just don't just make a New Year's resolution, I'm going to improve on such and such next year. There needs to be a plan in place. 
that says I'm serious. I mean, had Gedalia put a plan in place, he might have lived out his years. Instead, it's because of his naivete that to this day, this is a minor fast of mourning that the remnant of the Jews disappeared from the land. That like the northern tribes, they were gone. Because they, they didn't really have a plan of repentance. They definitely had a plan of prosperity. They definitely had a plan of personal security but it doesn't look like they had a real path to repentance. So, 